Well, thank you so much for, for coming on the show with me. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. My pleasure. Um, so I thought it'd be a great, a great place to start um, it would be essentially like if, if you could introduce yourself and, and share um, a little bit about like who you are and where we are and, yeah. and what you're creating and everything. All right. Well, my name is Kevin Larkin. I am a musician, producer, and all-around artist here in Denver. Uh, my main medium is definitely sound. Um, that involves production, performance, um, and everything in between. Let's let's rewind in time. And I, where, where did you where did you grow up? I grew up in Southeast Michigan, um, and I moved to Colorado when I was 18 to go to CU. So, um, and then I never went back to Michigan and I've been in and out of Colorado since about 2000, so for about 18 years. Gotcha. Yeah. What did you go to school for? Like you went to school in Colorado? Yep, I went to CU. I was actually a, a structural engineering student. Um, so that was uh, a good way to, Boulder is actually the perfect town to kind of figure out who I really was and what I really wanted to study. And that's when I fell in love with music was in Boulder and then realized, unfortunately, around when I graduated that I had uh, found a different calling and didn't want to do anything to do, you know, have anything to do with structural engineering. That was a boring life. And I found music and, and started pursuing that pretty seriously. Wow. Well, was it um, a particular moment for you when you discovered music for yourself and sound and everything, or was it a gradual thing for it you? Was, music was always around, so my mom played piano. Um, me and all my brothers and sisters were all in the band at one point or another, you know, in middle school band. So I, I, I grew up taking piano lessons. Um, I played a little bit of French horn, but I think it wasn't until high school when I kind of got into music, started playing a little electric guitar with friends listening to, you know, Grateful Dead and Fish and, and Bob Dylan. And um, I realized, I think in high school, that there was something about music that really spoke to me. And then um, my first song, I think, was about my senior year. And that was, that was one of the moments, I'd, I'd say, that really kind of rocked my world in music where you know, it felt like I was going around with this secret that I could at any point just play something and sing something that was totally uniquely me and and kind of like, so I, I would obsess over lyrics in class and things like that and kind of, um, yeah, really drawn to that, that form of expression, especially not having really been introduced to it in any other way. It was mostly through the artists I was listening to. Like I didn't have any, many friends that wrote songs, so it was you know, mostly through listening to Bob Dylan and The Who and things like that, that, that really kind of sparked that curiosity. Um, and then when I got to Boulder, I discovered folk music for the first time. Uh, heard mandolin, bluegrass, Irish music, all that stuff for the first time. There's great communities, uh, you know, in Boulder at that time, in particular Irish music and bluegrass, that I, I bought a mandolin and then the obsession was truly on. I, I haven't put it down since. So, bigger picture, um, when it comes to sound, mm -hmm. like what, what is it to you about sound that you're drawn to? Sound is, um, yeah, I think th there's a difference between music and sound, and I think that music is organized sound. So it's, it's um, time-based sculpture is kind of how I think of music. So it, it, it starts with this uh, range of frequencies that is sound. You know, like you walk outside, you hear high frequencies with the birds, the car rumbles by, you hear low frequencies. So all of this, our brain just writes off as noise. Um, but at any minute, you can tune in to any one of those things and hear something musical in it. So I think sound to me is... It is that awareness of what what you're hearing and then music is taking that and molding it into something repetitive so music has a lot of repetition something that you get used to and that you want to crave more of as you hear that repetition so I think for me a lot of it, I do think of it like a sculpture um, especially now with 
you know, production techniques that are possible with sound um, are pretty amazing. So you can make music out of pretty much any sound you hear or record or produce or synthesize or play on an actual, you know, instrument. Um, so I think, you know, with sound being this very flexible format to explore, there's just an awful lot you can do with it. And uh, it's just really exciting to me that you can do so much with this thing that's always around us. And process-wise for you, I mean, when, when you have an idea, and I guess maybe, and, and I guess you tell me, but maybe it makes sense for me to ask you this sort of in the context of having an idea for a song. Right. Um, but any other, I mean, other than that as an idea, I'm just curious about like how you, where you start, I guess, when you're exploring an idea for a song. So usually for songwriting, um, it'll either just happen, you know, the muse, which um, lately in collaborating, uh, there's been more of a specific scene in mind, which is, uh, which is a, a really fun way to compose. Um, where you have a set length of time and you have a general idea of what the song should be about. Um, and a lot of times through, you know, through collaborations, it, it becomes like a symbol or something. So say it's about, um, you know, the last one we did uh, with Chimney Choir was a, Gre a lot of Greek mythology based. So um, one exercise was to picture a whole scene and then score it. So that's the one really effective tool I think um, that can be done with songwriting is you know you score a scene in your head and so you know it starts off on a beautiful sunny day and then some event happens that changes that and then things get a little dark and then they resolve so tension and resolution you know playing with that and and with songwriting in that sense it's nice because you start to picture things in your head with what what the sounds are, what the lyrics could be, based on the characters or based on the scene that you've imagined or created or, or, or read about. So I think that's one large part of it. It's a lot of free writing on these uh, bigger scenes. And then when it comes time to uh, actually get something down and recorded, I like to do the same exercise with sound. So first of all, lyrically, you can go and, and write a lot about the symbols and the kind of the feel and the characters and just kind of invent a lot. You get a lot of material for that. And then likewise with the sound, picturing what's happening, what sounds might be useful and building a palette of that as well. And then combining those two ingredients in the end. So you have this palette of sounds you've kind of created and free associated as well as the lyrics and any melodic ideas. And then you kind of combine them into a, a produced track or you, you know, you start to mess with, sound texture, um, melody, things like that. When you're in it within like, I guess really no matter like sort of which stage of your process that you're mm -hmm. in really, um, is there is there anything in, in particular that sort of gets you into this space of like really having momentum in the work and sort of getting into that flow and having that kind of focus? Yeah, I think um, definitely dedicated time, un undistracted dedicated time is um, is essential just to be able to get lost in the in the process itself. Um, and so I think yeah, overall separating the stages of creativity has been really effective for me. Um, you know, if there's a time to just be designing sound and and not worrying about form. And then a time to worry about form, or even you know even before that, just getting a conceptual palette, you know, and and doing a lot of writing before sound even enters the picture is very useful, um, because I think for each stage it has you have a foundation that you need um, to effectively move forward, so you don't get caught up, you know, get too far and be like, oh, you know what, all I needed was that one, you know, synth tone but I didn't explore it. So now I'm gonna kind of take away from this phase of putting things together into finding a tone. So I think like doing a lot of the setup for each of the phases and then, and then losing yourself in the phase. Um, and you know, there's a few uh, 
techniques like that that I think have really helped with um, with the creative process in general to get efficient with it. And so, because oftentimes, you know, you can spiral down a wormhole and, and it's hard to come out, you know, but ideally you're kind of, you see the overall picture the whole time, but you give yourself permission. You know, if, if you're prepared enough, you can give yourself permission to go through and, and really lose yourself in it mm -hmm. as opposed to get hung up on a detail. Sure. Do you find, because I find it sometimes um, challenging to have the discipline to not want to take something, like when I'm in the exploratory phase with an idea, let's say, to then start playing with its form. Right, and, right. And having that, like, do you find it tough to sort of hold yourself back? Oh, definitely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think, well, that's another thing, because who knows, like, if you would have stopped that part, you know, you might not have ever brought it there. So I think all those rules have to be taken with a grain of salt. You know, you kind of set it up to, to know your habits, you know, and be like, oh, this is usually the point where I just kind of go down into this space, but it would be better if I stayed over here. So you tell yourself these things, but then, yeah, you have to let them go because, you know, some of the best stuff comes from just no rules. <laughs> I guess another thing I'm I'm curious I'm always curious about too is like how you approach taking risks in your work. Uh-huh. And and within that um like when something doesn't work, right. like when something fails essentially, then how how you think about failure as well and and navigating that. Yeah, that's a good question. Um I think uh, one of the hard things in life and in art is letting go, um, which is something that I think you just have to get used to doing. Um, I found that with, if it was all me doing it all the time, it would be very difficult. Fortunately, I've, I've been able to work with a lot of people that kind of move things along. And so, you know, there's a shared responsibility and, and in creating a project or something like that. And so it, it kind of moves at a different pace. I definitely find on my own that I have a harder time letting go of an idea or uh, an attempt. You know, it's like this, this means something to me and I want to convey it and share it, um, but it just never finds its right footing, you know? And, you know, years might go by before it does. Um, but I think one thing with the collab collaborative process is that you, um, it's a group shared thing. So you might be really attached to something and if you want to keep it, you have to figure out why and, and really articulate that to others. And so your refinement process is um, a lot stronger and your own self-criticism is stronger and your, your criticism from your peers is stronger. So only the strong, um, you know, the, the right things come through, I think. When, you, when it's put with that lens on it, you know, um, which is something I appreciate about collaboration is, you know, you really get to the root of yourself more so than you would have alone because you have to be able to articulate it and share something. I think in a lot of um, the collaborations, there is this, this little magic thing that happens towards the end that, um, because there's so many loose ends you have to tie up, you know, and then oftentimes your focus shifts to this one moment or thing that you didn't think was very important that becomes kind of like the emotional center of, of the whole thing. Um, so yeah, I, I love that moment. And, uh, and it can be scary. You know, I, I just think of a lot of times like, well, what's, what's it going to be? Or like, what's, you know, what's going to be the name of it? Or, you know, and it, all this, you know, unknown questions that kind of freak you out because it's coming up. You got to you know, put it out into the world and then it always, you know, if you just trust it and you, and you trust, you know, the process, then you're, it'll always just manifest itself in the right way. I love that. Yeah. Do you find that too with like, you don't quite know or you know it's going well, but then like there's that moment? Yeah, I think yeah, there is this certain level of uncertainty. Yeah. I think in like in the process, um, I... It, it, it bugs me every time. Like there's, yeah. a, there's a certain, there's a certain aspect of it, but then it's, it is interesting just it's sort of the buildup to letting go. Yeah. Like you described it of, 
like it ends up making the piece that much stronger. Right, right. You know, and 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 I like to I like to think that that sort of the, that that's just a necessary part of the process that of, unknown, of that that unknown that uncertainty. Yeah, and then just like I feel like everybody talks about like trusting the process, but right. you know, also like trusting your own process, and that, yeah. you know, even if you haven't necessarily done it before that one way or another, it's going to find its way because it's you. Yeah, right, right. And you're motivated and you won't stop until it's done. <laughs> exactly. Is there a particular like favorite or, or a memory of a favorite um, thing that you recorded so far? One of my favorite sounds uh, was on a chimney choir recording uh, and it was, we had booked a tour in Europe and we were trying to tour. I say trying because it was a, it was a pretty rough tour. <laughs> there was a lot of sleeping in muddy tents and, and kind of scrapping by, but we ended up in this Belgian train station um, and I had, I was recording the whole time with the field recorder and and just set it down and all these people were shuffling by and then I think at the end someone said are you recording and it was David or Chris said are you recording and I said yeah and then she said let's go and then it ended and we ended up putting that in a song and every time we play that part in the song it just it just brings me there I don't know it just like conjures up this uh, really cool feeling it's kind of like a somber part in the song and it just yeah I don't know it brings me back there and to that feeling we had on that tour, which is interesting that, you know, and it, and it goes on for a while. You hear the people shuffling. I can even remember what the kid looked like shuffling across the floor in the train station. Wow. I can visualize it. <laughs> the way that you're describing it. Well, what's the best place for people to find you on, yeah. online? What's, what's a good place for, to send people to? So um, chimneychoir.com is where uh, Chimney Choir is housed. We're also on Instagram. Um, pineross.com is kind of my own projects and collaborations that's also on Instagram mm -hmm. um, and those two spots you can normally find it I also have an experimental kind of electronic composition name called Amateur Astronomy oh, wow. which is uh, on SoundCloud on SoundCloud yeah okay cool well thanks again for thanks for having me Zach yeah, yeah it's been really fun I really appreciate it yeah.